Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Before we get into today's video, I wanted to take just a quick second to share with you my top three Maligator Mom must-haves. First on my list is Tactipup.com. Now these are the collars that you see my dogs wearing in all my videos, and I personally prefer the two inch width. You can get them with their name embroidered on them, and I always have them add a handle. These collars are made with a cobra buckle and all metal hardware. They are incredibly durable and they are made right here in the USA. So if you're interested, check out tactipup.com and use my code MALLIGATORMOM to save 10%. And number two, everybody wants to know, what do you feed your dogs? Well, this is it. I feed my dogs Munster Milling. Now this is a customizable kibble, so you can actually go onto their website and select additives that they will mix fresh into your bag. It's absolutely phenomenal. I add things like bacon fat, salmon oil, probiotic, and freeze-dried elk. If you're interested, use my code MALLIGATORMOM and you will save 55% off your first custom bag. And number three, if you are interested in online dog training videos, you definitely need to check out robertcabral.com. I have consumed a lot of online dog training videos and Robert is by far the best. Head over to robertcabral.com, use code MALLIGATORMOM. Hey guys, welcome back. It's me, Maligator Mom, and today is actually going to be the first in a three-part series that I plan to upload all about Malinois puppies. So uh, this is actually the first time I'm ever attempting to create a series for my channel. So I hope that you guys enjoy it. You'll have to let me know if this is something you would like me to do more of. I always think it's very beneficial when you can take a subject and really dive a little deeper into that subject by breaking it up into a series of videos. So it's something I would like to try out and explore on my channel. Your feedback to uh, this type of content is going to be very much appreciated. Make sure that you drop a comment. So uh, here's the series. The first video is going to be today, and it's all about how to pick a Belgian Malinois puppy from a litter. So I'm going to share with you exactly what it is that I look for when I go put eyes on a litter and pick which one I'm gonna be bringing home. A lot of people wonder, is there a science to it? Is it a roll of the dice? We're gonna find out. I think it's a little bit of both. And then the next two videos that follow up this series are going to be the uh, actual trip that I take to go pick this litter. I'm gonna bring you guys with me and be completely transparent. You're gonna see a whole video of me actually going out to a breeder facility and assessing this litter and picking a puppy that I like and all the different things that I look out for and test for and observe. I'm gonna share that with you. Hopefully we'll have a chance to also do a little Q&A with the breeder. And then to end the series, I'm going to show you the first 24 hours back at home with your Malinois puppy. So if this is a series that you're interested in following along uh, with, then I suggest that you hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications. I typically upload every Saturday at 9 a.m. But without further ado, let's kick off the series. So you wanna know, what is it that I look for when I am picking a puppy out of a litter? Let's find out today. So what exactly am I looking for when I go out to a breeder to put eyes on a litter and assess and pick a Malinois puppy from that litter? What exactly am I looking for? Well, that greatly depends on what my goals are for that specific puppy. I mean, think about it. If I'm trying to pick a puppy because I have goals of work or sport for that dog, then that's going to be completely different than if I were picking a puppy who I just want to be maybe an active companion. Those are, those are going to be completely different traits and assessments that I'm making on that litter. So I wanna kind of break down, you know, just, just kind of drill down into what those nuances are and what it is that you can be looking for. No matter what it is you're looking for in a Malinois puppy, I want you to be able to take something out of this video. So let's drill down into what those things are. So the most valuable thing that you'll actually have at your disposal when you're making your pick is your breeder's insight. 
So your breeder has just spent the last seven to eight weeks getting to know these puppies. They've been assessing them, watching them, working with them, hopefully. Um, they understand all the little quirks and nuances that you have no way of knowing spending you know, 15 or 20 minutes with them. So please don't discount the fact that your breeder might be steering you in the direction of a particular puppy because they think that this is the right puppy for you. And chances are they're right. So definitely don't discount whatever advice or insight it is that they have to offer. It's, it's the most valuable thing at your disposal. So that being said, I still want a chance to assess this litter myself and see where they stand today. And one of the things that I'm going to be looking at is confidence. Does this puppy exude confidence? Are they naturally curious? Do they come up to me? Are they um, confident and unafraid to come and interact and engage with me? Or are they off in the corner afraid to come up to me? You know, those could be some red flags. Typically the most confident puppy in the litter is the puppy that I'm going to be looking for if I want to do some type of uh, protection work, if I want this to be a guard dog, particularly if I want this dog to compete in any kind of sport. I want a really confident puppy. However, if I'm looking for a dog who I want to be uh, more of a companion, then I actually do not want to pick the most confident outgoing puppy of the litter. I'm going to look for a puppy that's more in the middle of the road, a little bit towards the back of the pack when it comes to confidence and um, you know, just the general outgoing nature of their uh, personality. Another thing that I want to see is does this dog have workable food drive? So can I take some of whatever this dog is eating and do some very simple free shaping or luring of, of behaviors? Can I get this dog into a sit? Can I get this dog into a down? Keeping in mind that these are very, very young puppies and their exposure to this is probably very limited, if at all. A lot of breeders don't actually take that extra step to begin working food drive into their puppies. So if that's the case, then go ahead and ask your breeder to please not feed the puppies their breakfast or lunch um, before you get there so that you can get a more accurate representation of what their food drive really looks like. I personally want a dog with really high food drive. Um, most of what I do in the first 12 months of my puppies' lives is completely based around free shaping, positive reinforcement, using their their food, their meals for training sessions. I mean, it's just vitally important for me that this Malinois has really great food drive, no matter what you're picking this dog for. This is something to me that is a really big deal that I personally place a lot of stock in. Another thing I want to assess is their prey drive. So I'll simply ask the breeder to bring out a flirt pole and I want to see, does this dog go after the toy? Um, is he engaged? Is he possessive of the toy? Can we bring out a little bit of a distraction? So whether that's just a jug with some rocks or a clatter stick or a whip in the background, does this dog stay engaged? If he doesn't, if he comes off of the bite, how quick does he recover? Uh, all these things are really important to observe and pay attention to. Now, on the other hand, if I have a home that does not want a dog to work in any kind of protection or sport, then you probably don't want a dog with a lot of drive like that. And there's nothing wrong with that, that's okay. That's why we make these assessments. So again, this is how you spot those differences when assessing a litter. Let's also not forget to just take some time to sit back and watch them interact with their litter mates. Just observe for a while. How are they interacting with each other? Are there some dogs that are just a little bit more passive with their litter mates? Or do you have a bit of a bully, a dog that's being a little bit more dominant over his litter mates? Obviously, um, you're going to see these traits unfold in different ways as they get older. So that more dominant dog would be a great dog for a guard dog. One of the more passive dogs might be uh, a, little, a little more level-headed um, and, and probably better with a family or, or around children. So again, take that time to just sit back and watch how they play and interact with each other. Another thing I like to do is ask to see the parents. Now chances are most breeders don't actually have the pairing. They don't have the dam and the sire. They usually have one or the other, um, usually the mother, which is great. So if the mother is on site, 
ask to see the mother. And if you can't, then ask to see video of the mother. You wanna see proven workability in the genetics of these dogs. Now I'm hoping that before you've got to this point of actually picking your puppy, you've already done the due diligence of looking into the pedigree. So I don't wanna get into that in this video. Um, but it's really important to go ahead and take a look at the mother if she's there. So, uh, or at the very least, watch some video of the mother in action so that you can see uh, what she's like. You can meet her. Is she social? Is she level-headed? What is her temperament like? These are all going to be uh, clues into how your puppy is likely to turn out. Now, there is um, a commonly believed um, theory that most of how this puppy is going to turn out comes from the mother. In fact, a well-known trainer, Avi Cohen, has actually been quoted as saying that he believes as much as 75% of the genetic ability and temperament of this dog is passed down from the mother. You can also ask for a demonstration of how these puppies act around noise. Has there been much noise desensitization? Um, what are they with different tactile surfaces? So some things that you could ask your breeder to do, for example, is to get out a clatter stick. Um, you know, maybe they don't have something like that, but even just a food bowl or something that you can bang and make some loud noise, you can watch the reaction of this, of this litter of puppies to these loud noises. So um, say you bring out a bowl of food and you're gonna be clanging the bowl. Are these puppies running towards you? Is there one puppy that's running towards you and barking really aggressively and doing anything they can to get to you or to get to whatever it is that you've activated by making the noise? That's probably not the dog that you want when it comes to picking for a lower drive, family companion level type of dog. That's the dog that you want if you're looking to get um, you know, into sport or work or hobby or have goals for this dog. So uh, when it comes to the noise, if you see a dog, you know, you gotta keep in mind that these are young puppies, so you have to have a level of forgiveness to uh, different situations and scenarios because they are so young. So if you make this loud noise or this loud clatter, then um, one of the puppies gets afraid or they're startled, that's okay. That's not necessarily like count that dog out. Pay attention to how fast it takes them to recover. You know, they might be startled, but then they're right back in the game. So that's okay. There has to be some forgiveness. These are very, very young babies. And when it comes to the tactile services, ask the breeder to do some things like, can you pull out a tarp and put a tarp on the grass? Um, you know, will they cross the tarp? Will they walk across the tarp? Or, or does one puppy put their paw on the tarp and it makes that crinkly noise and they're like, oh gosh, I'm out of here. I can't handle that. Uh, these are all things that you need to be paying attention to because these could have consequences on your success or failure with the goals that you have for this dog. So there you have it. Those are the types of things that I am looking for when I go out and assess a litter to pick a Malinois puppy. Now, all that being said, I don't think that this video would be complete if I didn't include this little caveat. So I do want to take just a moment to say that the most important thing, the most leverage you have is finding a good pedigree. Because at the end of the day, you could go out and you could pick a puppy for um, you know, work or sport. So you've picked a very high drive puppy and you could take this puppy home and six weeks later, he could be a bit of a slug. And it just is what, what it is. It's just a roll of the dice sometimes. You, you just never know. A puppy at eight weeks old can look completely different six weeks later. And he'll look completely different six months later and completely different six months later than that. So, um, you know, we have to remember dogs are not robots that, you know, come out on a production line and we just enter in what it is we want and they just pop us out this perfect puppy that we take home and build into whatever, you know, we want to build it into. That's not reality. The reality is, is that these are living individual beings. And the only real leverage you have when picking a puppy is their pedigree. Genetics really do make a difference. So just make sure that you understand that sometimes you're just going to get what you get. And I've seen it happen a lot. I've seen people um, go pick the most confident drivey puppy out of the litter and then come home and six weeks later, the puppy is a total slug. 
I've seen it happen many times and I have seen the exact opposite happen. I have seen very unengaged, you know, sleepy, uninterested puppies come home and six weeks later, they are just little psychopaths. So, um, you know, it is a bit of a crapshoot. It is a roll of the dice. So just make sure that when you are going to pick a puppy, the number one thing that you have put at the very top of your list is that puppy's pedigree, because that's really the most valuable thing that you can do when, when picking a puppy is, is pick from a good genetic pool. Because essentially, you're not gonna really know what you have in a dog until this dog is around 18 months old then you're gonna have a pretty good idea of what you've got in a dog. There's just no way to know that at eight weeks old. These are infants, they're little tiny babies. Show me a dog at 18 months old and I'll pick a dog at 18 months. But um, that's just not the nature of the beast, right? So people want a young puppy, they wanna go pick a puppy and raise and build a dog and bond with a dog and that's, there's nothing wrong with that, that's wonderful. But if that is your plan, then you just have to understand that no matter what you do, sometimes it's just a roll of the dice. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for today. But don't forget that this was just part one in my upcoming three-part series. So next week, you're actually going to come along with me when I go and physically assess a litter and pick a dog from a breeder. I wanna show you guys what exactly that process looks like. So you're gonna to get to see all of the different observations that I make and assessments that I make, and then I'll break down why exactly I chose that puppy. So if you're interested in this journey, then definitely make sure that you hit the subscribe button, ring the bell for notifications so that you don't miss out on this series. I will see you guys same time next week.